Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Survivalists, what they call survivalists, and preppers, and people who store food, and store tools, and learn skills, and do kind of bushcraft, and who get themselves ready for a disaster, you know, that may or may not come. They're actually, they're actually clever. You know, it just made me realise that, it's like, if something happened, like something like, you know, an electromagnetic pulse, you know, an asteroid came near the Earth, or a huge flare from the sun, and it knocked out all the electronic systems, which means everything couldn't start from trains to cars to planes to... Nothing, nothing would work. Nothing, right? It, I, I couldn't imagine how people today would survive. They'd be dealing with their... You know, they're trauma on two levels, right? Firstly, the psychological level. How would they survive without their sports and soap operas? Now just think about that, right? Sitting there in the dark, not able to have their kind of like, their, their what is essentially medica a form of medication that's given to them by the media. Psychological medication, right? Down on top of that, right? They go down to the shop and there's no food in the supermarket because the delivery trucks can't come along. And looters have taken the rest, right? Also, because they will be used to mainly junk food with low nutrition and, you know, low vitamins, they will quickly crash, particularly because of the high carbohydrates in most modern diets. You don't know about people here who don't really cook. They, they buy all the convenience foods and fast foods, right? Many of them don't even know how to, like, prepare, you know, they don't even know what basic nutrition is. They just fill up on calories. So that happens, right? It really would, like, be like the Colin McCarthy book, The Road. It really would. Or the movie. The movie is pretty good, too. But you would have the psychopaths who would actually become the cannibals. And they would be doing things like that. They would be cannibalizing people. I think people in a countryside would have a better chance of survival once they could protect themselves from kind of invading hordes. Because you'd have farmers who would share their milk and they would breed cattle and breed pigs who can live off grass and things like that. Particularly in a country like Ireland, it would be so bad where you, you know you have a temperate climate. It would be very much more difficult than a cold climate. But people who would have guns could hunt deer and you know things like that, and they would survive. God help anyone in a city. I, I totally... Uh, I, that would be terrifying. Because you would have people who... Their lives are so completely controlled. They're medicated by media. 
by social interactions, by behaviorism, in terms of their job and stuff like that, or even things like electric, alar alarm clocks. They're, they're bloody mobile phones and cell phones, for God's sake. You're talking about an entire bunch of people who would not survive, because they wouldn't know how to survive, and they would have, you know, enormous psychological breakdowns. On top of that, you might have people who, after a few days or a few weeks, when they're they're really starving, and they wouldn't have they would have food in their garden like nettles and dandelions and haws and all kinds of berries. They wouldn't know how to eat them. So then they would start attacking people in their houses who still might have been able to somehow survive on a bit of food, and the ones if they had weapons like a machete or a hammer even. A guy could take on ten of those girls and kill them. Easy, no problem. Because they wouldn't have the physical strength because of the, you know, the glycemic shock of not having their, their, their carbs. And they'd have no, they'd have no protein. And yet, you see, people say, oh, these survivalists and preppers are nutcases. They're paranoid nutcases. You know what survivalists and preppers are? You know what they really are? Our great grandparents. UFOs is something that has always kind of annoyed me. I read all the books when I was growing up, and I always thought it was the greatest cliche possible. It was just a world full of cliches until I discovered the work of two people, two people, John Keel and Jacques Vallée, and they started to talk about the UFO experience as part of a continuum. That was belongs in the same world as sleep paralysis, fairies, ghosts, poltergeist, gyms, all that stuff. It was part of that world. And that's how I I see it. I may be ignorant about it, but I'm deeply distrustful of the ideas of it, space brothers visiting us. And they will reveal themselves when the time is right. So I asked Adam and Adam suggested this to me and I want to thank him for coming on. This is Adam from the Glasgow Truth. Uh, group and I've been on his own radio show a couple of times and uh, are you there Adam? I am here can you hear me? I am indeed I you clear it loud and clear thanks for coming on can you put me straight with my introduction agree with it or add something to it what do you think the whole thing can be summed down to before we get to the nitty gritty? <laughs> well that's, trying to sum up the whole thing well that's a, that's a task and a half um, uh, I mean I, I guess I guess the way I would probably introduce um, myself in this regard would be to sort of just talk about my own experience into this whole area. Um, but, you know, I, I, I sort of went through the whole, you know, quote unquote, waking up thing, you know, the experience and you find out about 9-11 and you find out about a whole other bunch of things. And um, when you go searching on the Internet, when you when you finally realize that, you know, things are not uh, as they seem to be and you, you're looking for answers, Generally speaking, you know, the first thing you find is um, all of these websites talking about UFOs and aliens and extra dimensional entities. And, of course, you know, David Icke is very famous for this, among a number of others. And um, the, um, the general sort of, I mean, this is, obviously this doesn't uh, apply to, to everybody, but there's, there's a lot of, you know, people out there um, well-financed, well-backed with a, with a lot of... Um, you know, sort of support behind them, promoting the idea that um, all of humanity's problems and in turn all of humanity's solutions are somehow related to some kind of alien agenda, um, whether it be bad aliens uh, who are, you know, at the heart of the New World Order and uh, are trying to, you know, depopulate the planet and create a one world government and blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, and on the other hand, you've got, you know, the whole idea of, of good aliens as well. <laughs> so it's um it's one of the things that is presented to people as being a, a kind of a, a one size fits all solution for all the problems on the planet right now is is that it, it's the aliens you know and yeah. that that's very very appealing and that's why it's been so successful and you know I went I went into that stuff for a few, for a while you know I, I I'd admit I got kind of caught up in it because it's very very exciting um it's uh, for a lot of people, I think it's a lot easier to accept the idea that 
you know, all of this pandemonium that we see on the planet right now was, was caused by or is being caused by some mystical faraway uh, group of uh, entities from some other planet, you know, whether it be, you know, Sirius or Orion or, um, you know, what was the other one? They did? The, the Greys from... Um, the Draconian. The Draconian. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of planets and a whole bunch of ideas and a whole bunch of races that are supposedly, you know, uh, out there and are affecting our destinies as we speak. But um, I think um, that... <sighs> The, 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 yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that's the other side of the agenda. I think that yeah. it's a complex. I agree, it's a very complex thing. It is, Absolutely, yeah. the the alien agenda is the Christianity after Christianity. Yeah. It's salvation from above. It's the old the old thing again. The sky gods coming to rescue us. That's right. Yeah. So I don't have to rescue myself. It's, exactly. It, you know, yeah. there's no difference between an alien channeling cult. And a, and, a, and a Christian revival cult. It's the same thing. Get yeah. on board, do as you say, pay your penance, and yeah. you will be saved when the event comes. If the event is bad aliens who are coming to destroy us, you will be transformed into another planet or another being. If it's the good aliens, they will select you as one of the rulers of the earth. To me, it's incredible. Yeah. You know, for all these people talking about how spiritual they are, when you think about it, it's ultimately rooted in the worst kind of na- na- narcissistic ego mentality that somehow I'm special. I'm special because the aliens know about me. I often thought that about this update, ab- alien abduction thing. You know, you could look at the psychosexual yeah. aspects with the anal probes and everything, but this very idea yeah. that these things flop flown all across the universe to come into my bedroom and put an implant in me is spectacularly narcissistic. Yeah. You're not that important. You're a nobody, but it makes you feel important. It makes you feel like a stick marker in Italy in the 1920s. I'm the one bleeding the wounds of Jesus. It's it's the same thing that keeps coming back. Yeah. But however, I do believe that many of these people are reporting sincere experiences. I know very sincere and honest people who've had incredible experiences, including the annual abduction experience, and I can tell you for a fact they're not mad and they're not lying. How do you feel about that? Well, yeah. I mean, I've seen UFOs on a number of occasions. I don't know what they are. You know, I can't, I can't prove uh, that they were this or that they were that. Um, my personal uh, opinion on this is that um, some of these occurrences or some of these events or experiences uh, may be um, and I think most, I think some of them are at least um, due to, um, I think what some people are experiencing are, um, you know, basically military operations, you know, yeah. top secret, um, you know, highly advanced technology that's being developed at the, the very top of the military industrial complex. And I think, um, I think it would be silly to, to, to not deny that, uh, that that's going on. But on the other hand, I, I'm also open to the idea that, you know that, that there are um, phenomena that people really do witness or experience in some way or another, uh, which are not particularly physical or corporeal in any conventional sense. And Carl Jung had a lot to say about this phenomena when he studied it um, in the 1940s and 50s, when the whole UFO wave or the whole UFO obsession began after Roswell. Um, you know, his whole theory on the issue was that this was more of a psychological. Um, thing that this was uh, basically just the modern re-rendering or a modern version of of demons and fairies and and ghouls and and whatnot. Um, that there was this, there was much more of a psychological component here that said a lot more about the individual state of mind, the individual's fears, uh, the individual's desires for redemption, the individual's desires for uh, to be connected to something greater, to to, to have some kind of secret knowledge. And so I think that is definitely a factor or at least a part of this whole phenomena. Yeah, um, but again, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's very much where I would come from, coupled with the military yeah. aspect. You know, Roswell. Yeah. Roswell's always been an interesting one. How people have such a strong need to believe in alien visitation that they suspend all logic. You have Roswell. Yeah. They find pieces of metal on a military base. 
during the height of the Cold War. The only witnesses are other military personnel in the U.S. Air Force. It's leaked to the media in such a way that it gives you a tempting little bit of titillation. It's almost like, you know, esoteric porn. You get a little yeah. bit of it, it turns you on. You, you, and the obvious conclusion is that this was a Cold War propaganda operation to make maybe Americans believe that we have alien technology, the Russians can't bomb us. Because in Roswell happened like right after Joseph Stalin successfully detonated an enormous H-bomb. And Americans were filled with incredible fears and neuroses that were not so powerful after all because the great red enemy. And then you had movies like, you know, Invaders from Mars, the Red Planet and so on at the same time in the cinema coming out, coming out around the same time. And to me, it was a huge, big psychological operation on behalf of the military. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree with that. And I think um, it wouldn't have been possible unless... Um, the, the the very concept of um, paranormal, paranormal experience has not been built up over yep. many, many centuries through, um, for example, even the Catholic Church um, and a lot of other religions and a lot of other you know, mystical belief systems that people have been conditioned into over the, over the centuries and possibly thousands of years. Um, I, I, I don't think that the, the, the belief in you know, the whole idea of UFOs and, and space brothers and sort of um, uh, humanoid type aliens coming down to visit the planet and possibly meddle with our destiny or even improve it or even come and save us. I don't think any of those ideas would have been possible had it not been for years and years and, well, hundreds of years of conditioning through uh, mythology to, um, that led people to basically accept the idea that, you know, um, something like this was possible. It's like the, the, the seeds were sown a long time ago and all they did was activate, activate those beliefs when you know, things like Roswell happened. Um, people were already prepared at that point in time to accept, you know, through, of course, you know, science fiction always plays a big part of this as well. Um, mm. You know, you had H.G. Wells and, and other people like that writing you know, various science fiction stories beforehand, but um, it's like a, a, the seeds of this idea, I think, have been sown into the culture for, for a long time, a long, long time before the actual, say, you know, the, the, the kind of um, watershed event or the breakthrough event of Roswell that happened. And it's, it's continually been built up from then. And, you know, once, once an idea or a possibility, uh, at least a possibility of something happening has been implanted into the mind through cultural or religious conditioning all it takes uh, and literally all it takes after that is for some little scant piece of evidence some some mysterious happening some something like Roswell where we're not sure really what happened you know the military came out one day and said oh uh, a, a flying saucer has crashed in Roswell and then the next day they retracted the story and said oh no it was a weather balloon you know yeah it's a all great it way of, it's a great way of building a mythology around yeah, it. they're you denying it it's right yeah. there, the whole thing. Oh, the reason why they haven't made contact is we're not ready yet. That's right, yeah. It's and, absolute and, rubbish. I mean, and, that's if you believe that one, you can you believe that there's a project a bridge in Brooklyn for sale. I mean, yeah. to me, that was an amazing one. We're not ready yet. And that also ties into how the, the, the elites feel about us, that we're, like, we're, as, we're garbage, the rest of us. We're not yeah. worthy of this knowledge. That's right. And yeah. people would have genuine experiences. They would have genuine paranormal as you said, you've seen them yourself, mystical experiences. Yeah. And because of this editorialization through government press releases and through science fiction, particularly after the spiritualist movement in the early 1900s, to extrapolate this experience into the sort of a preformed ideas that it must be something from somewhere else. And yeah. it always seems to happen. Do you ever notice? It always seems to happen at heights of great... Uh, social tension. Well, the yeah. Barney Hill thing in the United States, they were an interracial couple in New Hampshire who yeah. claimed to be abducted by aliens, happened right at the height of the American civil rights issue where there was problems, where it looked like there was going to be an all-out race war in the United States. You had groups like the Black Panthers and so on. And then this interracial couple, a black man and a white woman who were happily married, are suddenly abducted by aliens and the, the interracial aspect of their relationship was very much put to the fore by the media. Yeah. 
Okay. Again, this would, this would, these people probably did experience something. They could have easily been hit with some kind of CIA weapon or drug. We don't know. Yeah. But they were very much used to calm people down by saying, the Space Brothers approve yeah, that's right. of interracial marriage yeah. in order to make people who were probably, very, you know, probably try and calm down the troubles. Yeah, yeah. I think... Um I think you're right in saying um, that these sort of the cultural phenomena keeps raising its head every time. There, there, you know, we are in a time of social, uh, socio-political turmoil because, as you say, you know, uh, Roswell happened just after the end of the Cold War. Uh, sorry, the, the beginning. So the after the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, you had Roswell, and then through time, you know, throughout the last sort of 50 or 60 years. The the public public interest in in this whole field of uh, study or this well I'm not going to maybe maybe not study but this whole this whole phenomena uh, you know always becomes most popular and most intense during times of uh, social confusion social um, sort of disarray and um, neuroses yeah and neuroses yeah. Um, because. It, it gives people an answer. It gives people something that they can latch on to. It gives people a way of explaining the world. And it's, it's in, in that sense, it's really no different, as you said before, to, to a religion. You know, and it's very appealing. It's, it's, it's much easier for people to believe that the aliens are responsible for everything that's going on right now rather than a group of extremely cunning and, ex and intelligent psychopaths. You know? mm -hmm. It's much more or, or then you have you can Then you have this situation where they couple... The psychopaths to the alien thing that yeah. makes it extra delicious if someone is say someone is prone to this kind of belief whether of a higher level of education or they're very idealistic you can get them through the back door that way yeah. you, you know in the you know like people of a less sophisticated time they would use the idea of the russian soviets commies and the red planet to sort of get normal people say in the midwestern america and southern america back in those days to, to couple the belief in the devil alien with the, the, the Soviets. In the same way today, you can actually say, well, psychopaths are actually aliens from other worlds who've entered the bodies. That can take it to a, the next level, which is like, for say, a person of a higher. And it's amazing how people of, of high education levels can actually fall into this because they're so desperate for an answer. And yeah. the CIA, I, you know, if you look at this, the CIA fostered these UFO cults. Big time. If you read Jacques Vallée's Messengers of Deception, out of the, the the top like universities and West Coast colleges like Berkeley, Caltech, UCLA in the 1960s and 70s, and you had the most remarkable phenomena of you know people like uh, what was his name, the guy from Heaven's Gate, Marshall oh, Appleby, yeah. yeah. showing up at these events where there would be rocket engineers, biotech engineers, and all kinds of people training for their PhD, and he'd start talking about a comet was coming. That would, you know, if you weren't on board now, we could, you know, we will escape. The, and this would have been at the height of the Vietnam War, of course, and the catastrophes of the Cold War. And you would have like 50 people that they would all drop out after a certain time. And these would be highly educated, intelligent people who'd be going up there to sign up for his little religion. Yeah, that's right. So well, I mean, I and think... it's playing on the fears you can get anything. Yeah, and, and it's also playing on the, you know, what we've had is, you know, 50, 60 years of, of, hardcore predictive programming from the inception of Star Trek and Star Wars and all of these other sci-fi shows like V um, and there's a whole bunch of other ones as well but you know for, for someone who's been raised you know whether they're educated or not and I think you know um, almost especially some of the ones who've been you know educated in the sciences or who are interested in things like astrophysics and astronomy you know if, if they've been raised on you know a program like Star Trek and Star Wars things like that the, the the possibility the idea of you know space brothers of humanoid type aliens living out there in civilizations all not that different to our own although highly advanced in technology is very easy for them to accept that because the idea has been implanted in the mind through fiction and yeah. then all it all it takes is you know a sighting of a flying saucer or a whistleblower who says they worked with aliens and all oh, of a sudden Wallace's episode or sleep, you know, whatever it may be, you know, all it takes is, is one little, you know, one possible fact, one, one sort of, um, one little piece of information, one little, um, 
you know, event or, 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 or issue that seems to validate those, th those inherent, those, um, pre-programmed beliefs and all of a sudden people are believing in it like it's gospel you know it's very very easy to do yeah and speaking of gospel you know i, I love the the remake of battlestar galactica the, the the modern the remake the one that's done about a few years back and I, it's really just exodus from the bible yeah the, the the humans are the you know going into space on the battlestar galactica and the fleet it's really it is it is the, the, the tribes of Israel or whatever leaving and, yeah. and spreading out through space. It's they're playing on the same archetypes, and, you know. And even like the Vedas in India are filled with stories of battles taking place in the sky in flying machines. Now these could yeah. be metaphors. Who knows? Maybe they're true. And I, I actually do believe there was incredible technology centuries ago that yeah. we've all lost. But it could have been true. But still, it validates the modern science fiction. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it validates them in just the same way that um, it goes, you know, just the way people, you know, you have someone like David I can talk about the reptilian aliens and then yeah. point to gargoyles on churches. Well, that's exactly it. And that's something that um, people like Alan Watt have um, brought up a number of times over the years. Um, and he's probably one of the few people out there who does speak to this issue um, very objectively and very honestly and explaining the fact that, you know, these archetypes, you know, the, the archetype of the, of the demon or the reptile is something that has been embedded into the collective consciousness over hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, and so, all it, again, all it takes is for some popular TV program, um, some science fiction franchise, or even some whistleblower from quote-unquote inside the system who's had, you know, uh, access to, to insider knowledge to come out and say, oh gosh, you know, there's all these different races and we've got bad aliens and good aliens. And that's all it takes for people who've already been preconditioned to, toward the idea that these uh, possibilities exist for that possibility to, then, to now become a reality and for it to be taken at face value and to be accepted as an actual reality. Well, that's fantastic. I, I, I totally agree with that. I've always, I've always enjoyed Alan, Alan Watts. And his, you know, his take on this thing. I think he does speak objectively about it and takes an awful lot of flack because of it. Yeah, yeah. Because he does. people <laughs> do not want to be told that the that the tooth fairy does not exist. Yeah. It comes down to that, or Santa does not exist. They may exist, but not made. They're not in this part of the world or this part of the universe. They, yeah. Their problem is now. I, I do want to go after the, the the break coming up after the song into the idea of extra interdimensionals because I think there could be something to that as well yeah again like I, I, I you know I revealed on the show here last week that I did have in front of some very credible witnesses a classic men in black experience yes so, yes I heard about that yeah yeah and that's that's I know what I experienced and I had two witnesses and I've had you know I've had a paranormal I, I've never seen a UFO in the sky I've never seen that but I have had experiences that I know were, you know, what the, what I said at the beginning of the show, super normal. And funny enough, they did happen at periods where I was quite nervous or embarking on a new adventure yeah. or, you know, going on a new phase in my life. Are we triggering these, creating these, or opening a portal? We'll come back after the song. This is uh, the velocity of now, Thomas Sheridan, and I have Adam from the grass. Glasgow Truth Group, and we're having a fantastic discussion here on we're not we're offering opinions, we're not offering dogma. Remember that we're, this is not what it's about. We nobody yeah. knows what this. Dropy, Bulgaria's favorite laxative, proud to sponsor the Velocity of Now. Dropy will clean blockages from your anus, so you will be not unclean. Make it sloppy with Droppy. Having a great discussion here with Adam from the Glasgow Truth Group about what is the UFO experience? What are aliens? Why do we have these experiences? Why does this phenomenon exist? How much of it is controlled? How much of it is mythology? And how much of it is psychology? I actually believe it's a lot of all of those things, and I think Adam feels the same way, more or less. However, in this last half an hour, I want to bring up something that's basically, the, we could call it a fad at this point. 
the idea of the inner terrestrial. Now, to me, if there was an actual supernatural, otherworldly being aspect of this phenomena, they wouldn't fly off across the universe to be here millions of light years. They would actually already be here. We have the work of people like John Lash through his excellent book, Not in That Image. Now, it's not a book I completely agree with. But, however, I do think that there's a lot to that idea that there are other consciousness, other forms of life that exist within this planet that may be impacting upon what we call psychopaths. It's just speculation. It's just something that I think is worth study, but I'm not nailing my colors to any particular one mast. On this issue, but you cannot ignore the vast canon relating to the idea of jinns, demons. It exists in every culture, and I do believe that this is the supernatural aspect, possibly, of the alien concept. How do you feel about that, Adam? Yeah, well, that's a... <laughs> It's a big question, but um, I mean, I, I do think that there's definitely um, there are definitely forces or entities um, outside of what we would call reality. You know, possibly living in some other kind of uh, I don't know dimension or other plane of existence. Now, that's not to say that you know I believe uh, the theories of people like David Icke who talk about um, you know reptilian um, shapeshifters um, and inheriting you know the bodies of you know elite politicians and whatnot. However, at the same time, I, I do think that there are that there is some kind of phenomena on this planet um, that. Could be account that could at least account for for some of the UFO or you know paranormal type experiences you know and I've had one of those myself and if I may share this experience just you know it's just for a few moments and just to give people an idea of what I'm talking about um, I, I I I had an experience once where I um you know was uh, at home. And I was just about to go to bed and I was uh, just about to draw my curtains. And for some reason that night, <laughs> I decided that um, instead of drawing the curtains all the way closed, I'd leave the curtains open. Just there was a little gap that I could see out the window. I don't know why I did it that night, but something compelled me to do it. And about half an hour later, I got a sudden burst of adrenaline, a sudden burst of adrenaline, which I can't explain and which compelled me to look out the window. And the moment I got that adrenaline burst and looked out the window, I saw a giant <laughs> ball of light <laughs> fly past my window and off into the distance. Uh, really, really close. Uh, this wasn't a bird. This wasn't some piece of garbage flowing around the wind. This was a big ball of light, like, you know, what people refer to as orbs, basically. And... Um, this is something that's quite commonly reported among people who have had similar experiences, is that there seems to be some kind of correlation between the individual's consciousness and the experience of seeing one of these things. You know, I, I almost felt that there was some kind of premonition there. There was some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of link between my own consciousness and what I viewed. And this is something that's come up again and again in the UFO literature, is there seems to be a link between the individual consciousness and the experience of seeing one of these orbs. And that's, some, that's something I experienced personally, and it's something that a lot of other people have, you know, reported similar experiences of, you know, where they will be lying, you know, asleep at night, and they will wake up in a sweat all of a sudden, bang, like that, and have a strange urge to maybe look out the window or something like that. And they look out the window, and there's an orb, some glowing ball of light just floating there. And then maybe it whizzes off or disappears into thin air or something like that. Now, I have absolutely no idea what these things are, but I do know that I've seen them I've, and I've experienced them and that a lot of other people have had similar experiences where there seems to be some kind of link, or, you know, for lack of a better word, between the individual consciousness and, you know, this phenomenon. Yeah, I, I heard that story many times, John Keel in his book, Our Haunted Planet, talks about these experiences. When people see these, you know, quote-unquote UFOs, they say that often the experiences, they're not looking at a machine. They're looking at something that's alive. Yeah. 
That, and, and they're very aware that living entity that they're looking at is wired into their own consciousness. That's very much the impression I got, and it's very much the the kind of opinions that I've seen, you know, reported by people who've had these experiences, is that you know we're not looking at a, a, a physically constructed machine made by you know whatever it is, the military or whoever. This is something something else, and I don't know. You know, I, I could be wrong here, and the bottom line is that you know we we don't know what these things are, and that's that's really that really is the bottom line. But you know, at the same time, um, I had some kind of intuition or some kind of feeling that this was some kind of entity, you know, some kind of I don't know uh, disembodied non-corporeal consciousness, some kind of maybe a spirit or something like that. And you know this maybe sound pretty far off to far out to a few people, um, but at the same time, you know that this is not something that's just me that's experienced. It's a lot of other people as well. And, and so, just because it sounds far out doesn't mean we shouldn't discuss it. That's right. Once and we don't jump to conclusions that have as been long as we don't jump, that, that's yeah. the thing. I mean, I yeah. think it's healthy. It's, I think it's yeah. healthy and it's natural and it's perfectly reasonable and logical to discuss these issues. Um, the, the the only sort of line I draw on, on on these types of topics is that if you're someone like myself, for example, who you know runs a local group and is trying to get people to talk about so, you know simple basic issues, you know like the new you know anything to do with you know the sort of the mechanics of a new world order, and you're trying to um, you know raise people's awareness to some of the more basic uh, tangible things that are happening. Um, I don't think it does any good to mix up all of this uh, paranormal um, content with, you know, stuff that is is actually quite concrete and provable. Yeah, uh, they're, I, they're, I, both I, a lot. they're two different worlds. They're two, exactly, they're two they're different worlds. They're both worthy of study. They're both worthy of understanding. Yeah. So when, once you merge one t- with the other, yeah, you have this. You have oh, you have assassinated. Yeah, you've assassinated the, actual, the truth. You've assassinated yeah. it in the eyes of the masses. Exactly. Because, You're and that's be... half the reason they push these well, fake alien it. bodies and all this like Area 51 stuff yeah. out there in the Montauk project. Yeah. That's well, half it, it, the reason. I have no doubt that many of the top, you know, people within the UFO field who couple it with the, and I'm not saying David Icke, I actually think David Icke is a sincere man. I've never seen anything to, to, to suggest that he's, he's not, you know, if they're, if they're sincere in their beliefs, that's okay with me, okay? Yeah. But uh, I, I think some of them, particularly the American ones, I don't like naming names. I don't like trashing people. But yeah. yes, they seem to be someone's paying checks for them to, sit, to throw the stuff out there and then yeah. connect it to these issues like population reduction, uh, pollution, right. and so on, and you know the global warming thing and everything else. Of course, yeah. You know, and you even see memes appearing on your Facebook wall of an alien saying, "You mean you have a beautiful planet and you're destroying it?" Yeah. That to me is all predictive programming. Yeah. Uh, you know, see that you've shared your experience. I'm going to share you one of mine. I've written about this already, so some people might know about it. When I was 17 or 16, I was working in a restaurant in Dublin, and uh, I was washing dishes just as a part-time job. But I used to finish late at night, like one in the morning, and then I would cycle a couple of miles home. Uh, you know, the roads would be empty at night. It was perfectly safe back then to get back. And I was cycling along, I, I, I left the building that I was in, and I suddenly felt that I'd entered, entered into an altered state of consciousness. I was in yeah. a different, I can't explain it, I, I, I was in a, a dream, but I was awake, I was still going home from, from my job, and I was in it, but I felt like I was in a movie, and I was walking, I was walking down the street, forced the bicycle, and then I looked at this woman, this woman stared through the window, the second floor window of a building at me in a very sort of strange way and she looked like a ghost or something and I thought that was freaky enough and I started cycling down and I'm, I'm, I'm going down the road and in front of me this enormous white owl flies uh. in, in my path but with its wings beating so slowly that there's no way those wings could have kept it airborne you know what I'm saying yeah. it was, the, the wings were going too slowly and that was that was the first time I'd ever seen a, an owl in my life this thing was enormous and it was white and it flew slowly in front of me across the road into a park here we go again right people in England defriending or falling out people they've known for a long time 
because they didn't vote for Corbyn or didn't vote Labour. Or they voted Tory. Just like in America, when people fell out with friends who voted for Trump. Now, this is not an unusual thing in the world, really, is it? We've had civil wars in many countries where people, brothers have taken guns against brothers and families have fallen into battle like on either side of the armies uh, because of variant factions in civil wars. You would think as a people we had seen through that a long time ago. At least when people had civil wars in the past things were usually very bad. They barely had, they would be brought, brought to the having war by something like not having food on the table. Or the country just falling asunder. But the ones who are in the civil war mindset today, the biggest crisis they will ever have in their life is maybe the iPhone or the iPad battery ran down before they finished watching an episode of Friends. And this is, this is, this is the existence derangement syndrome. If you want, if you're going to fall, like my attitude is if I'm going to fall out with people, there's got to be a personal reason. They've had to have done something personal to me. I would never fall out with someone who had a different political view once that political view was only expressed. So by that I mean if they were if they were racist and kept it to themselves and didn't use it around me, I wouldn't be bothered unless they start and if they start but well, if they started to suggest violence or using that kind of language, I wouldn't want to be their friend. Uh, but that would be the extreme exception. The same if they were a Bolshevik and they're asking Otherwise, a person's political opinions, oh God, it's such bollocks, it's made up stuff. If you're going to fall out with someone, fall out with them because they set out to hurt you on purpose. That's really the only reason to fall out with someone is that they set out to hurt you on purpose. Uh, otherwise, or to use you in some way. Otherwise, you're, you're a bit of a bastard, aren't you really? Because if you fall out with someone who never did any, any, anything personal to you, especially if they were only ever kind to you, for no other reason than either political, well, or social is bad enough, social peer pressure, but, but political peer pressure is even worse. Because someone has a different view of a game that's played by the establishment is reason for you to fall out with them, to dehumanize them, to want. What are you in? A, what do you have a political opinion, or, or are you a member of a cult? Because that's how cults behave. This is my new family now. So they, hey, that's how they behave, and this, this is the arrangement. I'm seeing the same nonsense in the wake of when Trump won in America. People saying, "Oh, I'm going to." I'm going to move to Canada. Never did. Just all toys being thrown out of the cot, out of pram. Uh, California's going to secede from this, the nation. All bollocks. Hysteria. Uh, uh, Trump is going, to, is going to put all the minorities back in chains. This is the kind of things they were saying. Uh, women who've had abortions will be charged with of being murderers. And here we are, his second term coming up, and none of those things were even even on the cards. or any, That was just pure psychiatric in issues. And the same things are happening in the UK now. There's no way in hell they are going to deport EU workers overnight en masse in one go. And anyone who thinks that is hysterical. People who are whingy whiner, screamers, moaners, who will always whine. The, the world is full of cowards. That's one thing I've learned most of all in the last couple of years is that so many people are absolute cowards, particularly men. And they will bottle it out of peer pressure. 
uh, and stick a knife in the back of someone who never did them any harm. Uh, just, to, just, 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 I need a friend. I gotta have my friends. Those types, and f, they're easily replaced for every one of them. And I would say the same to you, who were involved in the the whole thing of like, oh, I lost a friend because I don't, I made fun of Corbin. Well, that was never your friend to begin with. As simple as that. Yes, I want to talk about higher education. Just exactly what is his purpose and does higher education serve humanity as a whole or does it only serve agendas and selfishness? I'm recording this in the wake of the horrific uh, attack that happened in Tunisia when a university educated extremist called Sayaf Saif Rezgui murdered nearly almost 40 tourists, mostly British and Irish, who were sunbathing on the beach at a holiday resort there. We're often told that these extremists come from the worst kind of ghetto, and that's simply not true. The greatest fanatics on this earth are always, well not always, but nearly always, and also the most murderous and genocidal and inhuman and psychopathic are nearly always a product of higher education and advanced college degrees. S uh, Saif Rezgui, even though the media will go on constantly about, you know, how he, he was an extremist, a fanatical extremist, they mention the fact that he went to college, is in the university and comes from a comfortable home, as if this is the an oddity surprising he turned out like this when in reality they come from almost nowhere else from barter meinhof pointing machine guns in people's faces and blowing them apart in germany in the 1970s to the brigada rossi in italy doing the same kidnapping robbing banks murdering innocent people and to Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge were all products just like the murderous and psychopathic Che Guevara, all products of well-to-do families and university education and higher degrees. And this story goes on and on and on. And yet no one stops to think, what is it about the universities that create these, these morons, these mindless killers? like Saif Razgui. No one ever stops to think about that. No, my, my son's a college boy. He's going to college. He's going to get his PhD. He's doing exactly what the professor is telling him to do. And likewise, these doomsday flying saucer debt cult members, comet debt cult members, so many of them have advanced degrees from universities also. They're sitting around a Ouija board or getting some psychopath who's their leader, comet leader, le comet cult leader, or flying saucer cult leader, to channel messages from outside space because they can't think for themselves. And they're sitting there at their PhDs and their master's degrees waiting for messages from the Space Brothers. That's why cult leaders target these people in college, and also their CIA handlers target them in college. Because they know that in university, by the time they've got to the master's or PhD level, every aspect of independent free will and thought has been has been educated out of them there is absolutely no proof that education higher education and university and college advanced degrees produces better or more intelligent human beings a few years ago the YouTube celebrity Jenna Marbles, who's this woman who basically tells you how to make, American woman, how to do your makeup like a slut, was given the James Joyce Award, I will post the link below here, by Ireland's most prestigious, so they say, University Trinity College in Dublin. James Joyce Award named after the great writer and was generally given to people who are culture changers, great artists, great thinkers, philosophers, poets. And so on. It was given to a woman who says 
you can barely articulate two words didn't he, didn't know where Ireland was watched the video didn't know where Dublin was never heard of James Joyce and could, didn't know what was going on and she was given the highest cultural award that a university can bestow upon somebody outside the degree now what even makes this more disturbing is when she and you watch the video when she enters the school the college itself the behavior of the students they're completely psychotic and, and hysterical these are the great minds of the future these are the these are the ones who will get their PhDs and masters and yet their hero is a YouTube celebrity who can barely articulate a sentence because she's famous And these same morons, after they've done everything that their college professors told them to do, obeyed every single order they were given, will then spend the rest of their lives on internet forums saying that anyone who questions fluoride in the water is mentally ill. This is how the whole system works. Anyone who questions globalism, there's something wrong with them. Now, well, we, let's go back to the university itself. There's always been the stereotype in Hollywood movies, and even in popular literature, going right back to like Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, that these students are radical in the colleges because they stood up to the college administration, whom they saw as conservative fuddy-duddies. The reality is completely different. These tenured professors are the ones who radicalize the moron students. You go to somewhere like Cambridge in England and, and see the, the sheer level of involved in the act student activist scene there. They're all the the children and grandchildren of the cultural Marxist professors who are like college professors all over the world receiving spectacular salaries from the taxpayers in unsackable jobs for life because they have tenureship. On top of this, many of these college professionals work, maybe most of them probably won't even work 20, 30 hours a week. And at work, a lot of that will be sitting in the office running other businesses on the side. A lot of them run internet businesses and do all kinds of other businesses like editing and proofreading. And they have free access to the college academic libraries. They have free access to things like mass photocopying and printing in the college and university facilities. And these are the ones who radicalize the students. And yet nobody talks about this. Nobody. So there's the image of the animal Saif Rasgui walking down the beach in Tunisia with a machine gun in his hand, and all that's missing from his from him is a the graduation gown and cap. Because what happens is why these morons come out of universities because they're the kind of people who need to be told what to think. They're not radicalized in college to standing up against the status quo. They're radicalized in college because the, the status quo is cultural Marxism and radicalization within these colleges. So they're, they're being incredibly obedient to their, to, their, to their lecturers and professors and to the culture inside the university. They're not being black sheep. They're being the prize students. And their graduation gown is a machine gun emptying the magazine of a machine gun into innocent British and Irish tourists sunbathing on a beach. Their graduation gown is sitting around in a, in a circle with a cult leader channeling aliens from the future. Or their graduation gown is screaming like a hysterical moron when Jenna Marbles comes in there and gets the James Joyce Award. And the professors and the whole faculty and the and the college and university staff generate all this. They are the ones who take people who could have been normal and turn them into mindless robots by saying the only way you're going to get your degree is doing precisely what we tell you. On top of that, in countries like the United States, students take out enormous financial loans and they have to justify this debt that they're going to go in for the rest of their lives by being extra obedient to the cult leader, which in a university is the tenured professor. There's no difference between a tenured professor 
in, in a top university and Jim's Jones in Jonestown or a drill sergeant in the Marine Corps. They all perform the same function. The demolition and the absolute annihilation of the individual, replacing it with the conformist repeater who does whatever they do without question. And I can guarantee you that Saif Razgui was not radicalized in his university by fellow students who had a copy, a copy, a copy of the Quran, but I can guarantee you, like Pol Pot killing two million people in Kampuchea, Cambodia, he was radicalized by... Why do the intelligence services create cults? Now, this is a, this is a good one, this one. Why are cults so integral to the intelligence services and why would they even bother with such things? Why would they why would they bother creating flying saucer or a comet doomsday or Christian or religious cults or anything like that? Well, it's quite simple. It's a way for governments, military organizations and also espionage groups and military groups to perform nonlinear warfare outside the jurisdiction of ethical ethical behavior and things like the Geneva Convention without a, a messy trail living back back to them. So suppose I was a suppose I was a a military a, a military guy, right? And I wanted to I wanted to take I wanted to take out some, you know as a target, but I could I could not have the trail leading back to the to the to the military group, to the espionage group, to the intelligence group, or whatever. So what you do is you will find, you will set up a, you will set up a a cult that will be based on a credible idea. You, but also you want it in such a way that you will recruit fanatics that you can generate into killbots. Now a good example of this would be, I was suppose I. Uh, Suppose I've, I've decided to set up this cult. Well, I need to create some kind of scientific legitimacy. So I will source a, a, prof a former professor who, you know, a real professor with a real degree and everything and things like this. And I will find dirt on them that they were a pedophile or something like that, or they were criminal behavior, or they came from a third world or Eastern Bloc country where they indulged in the most horrific and human rights violations and just as they're trying to start a career in the West, in the respectable academia, I'll say, well, you can either work for us or you will uh, we'll release these things about you and you'll be destroyed completely. You know, a picture of him with a young boy or something like that. So what they do, or else doing live human experiments back in the, the in, you know, back in the Cold War days and things like this. So what they do is then is they will, uh, or in the third world or something, South America, what they do then is they will say to them, uh, we're going to set you, well, they will then have sourced out a, a kind of a, a supernatural cult aspect. So they'll look for someone who's uh, an astrologer, who has a bit of a following or something like this, uh, someone who, does fascination at staring into people's faces to hypnotize them. Someone just like it could even be an innocuous, harmless new age group, whatever, or some of the flying saucers. And they will say, you're, you're going to join this group and you're going to provide the, the academic and the scientific, shall we say, uh, credibility to this group in order to recruit highly intelligent people, highly educated people, dumb people who are highly, highly, highly educated. So when they end up like, saying well you tell them things like the space brothers you know they they're communicating us through this you know through a glass of uh, they will believe it because how could it be lies when this top academic that believes it's to be true then you have the formation of the cult so then you go about uh recruiting them at universities mainly you, you have a nice mixture of like kind of morons who believe anything the type of people who you know trooper types coupled with used highly well-educated people, people who have PhDs and things like that. They've gone through the whole system and they have never learned how to uh, think for themselves. It's always been following orders. College, you know, the, the high school teacher, this, 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 the school exams, the high school counselor, then the college, the college lecturer, the college professor, the college, do you see the lights again? 
the college teachers, the college university professors and, and so on. They've, their whole life has been about appeasing authority figures. They don't understand how to appease or operate as themselves. So a cult leader using a mandate of we are scientifically, you know, grounded because we have this scientist in our group is what it, it will follow them because it's 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 the natural extension of when how they got their PhD. This is why cults the most crazy cults of all, like the most insane ones, are filled with people with PhDs and advanced degrees. They just can't think for themselves. They need an authority figure. No matter what, they have to be told these things. And eventually, the cult, you know, then I'm setting this cult up and I'm saying, okay, I want to have them attack it, something like that, or, or start to some kind of conflict, a false flag. They would get the most, the most sort of like, crazed fanatic in the group it's usually always a male it'll always be a male nearly and they would be a combination of gaslighting stockholm syndrome and endless mind washing and then the usual cold things of you know breathing exercises dancing exercise, strict diet control these kinds of things they will raise this fanatic to do anything and then they will place them in a state of dissociation and eventually Often they will be, sometimes they'll be betrayed by the cult and they'll, and they'll be told if you want to win back your place, because they'll have nothing else. They'll have everything, their relationships, their home, their job, their income, everything will be in the cult compound. There's no way of surviving outside. And, the, and they will say things like, well, if you want to get back into the cult, get back to your, your girlfriend and get back to your, all your friends there in the cult. The best way to impress them would be to, to deliver this pack. And so what if this person, if it goes wrong and this person is caught, they... They have no trail back to them. They've been hypnotized. They've been they've been like what you call MK Ultra kind of thing, Manchurian candidates. And there's no route back. And that's why the intelligence services and the military create cults. To it's a way of be, of getting operations done that would be highly unethical, highly dangerous as well. That you wouldn't want to risk your own operatives in, but you look for some mindless cult bot, cult you know kill bot or mindless robot who thinks a comet is coming to bring them to a different planet or it's a spaceship. We saw that. Now, the proof of this is everywhere. Look at Jonestown. I mean, I, it's got to the point now where I cannot find a cult or what they would call a family or an organization that was, does not go back. This is why this sex is a big thing among the pedophilia. We saw it with the family of God. The, ped, that was a, the, the fact that children were easily sexualized and access brought pedophil, pedophiles in. Then they would have photographs of them doing things with kids. And then they would say, you want to leave the cult? Oh, no, you don't. You have to do this first. You see, this is how it works. You see all the, you see it all the time. They, they compromise people. They, they get information on them. There's a very good TV show called The Path, where they show like an IRS agent who admitted that she'd into the cult in a kind of a, a, a kind of a confessional thing that she'd killed a young black child. And she ran away, she drove away from the scene of the crime and she'd been tortured by the guilt of it. So they'll, they'll have things on people. And this is the impetus. Now, it, it doesn't always go as spectacular as, as, you know, killing someone or planting a bomb or delivering a drug package or something. Often it will be just like smear campaigns, writing letters. Opus Dei is a good example of a cult that writes that, ex, that has people that write letters to the newspapers trying to influence Catholic policy and, at government levels. This kind of thing. It, it, it can run... It can run the gauntlet from a smear campaign against a person all the way up to got on the planes. It's it's very it's 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 how they do it. It's always been that way. I've been reading about an Irish group in the ninth in the seventeen eighteen mid eighteen hundreds called the Ribbonists, who were a secret lodge who were of fanatic Catholic bigots who were trained for this purpose out of Dublin Castle in order to infiltrate military and civic bodies in order to smash up any kind of unity between catholics and protestants that might affect the british empire so it's been going on forever forever now it's a uh, again the evidence again we have jonestown you know you don't you don't create people like susan atkins and squeaky from out of nothing everything like that jimmy savile is definitely a, either a military or an intelligence career you see, anyone with, he had a diplomatic passport, which is interesting as well. Why was a celebrity having a diplomatic passport? Why could he waltz into Israel during peaks, peace talks? And this kind of, he was delivering packages, he was delivering messages, he was working for them. A lot of journalists that work for the intelligence service as well. 
And a lot of them have been compromised also. I think it was Max Hastings that was actually working for MI5 and the IRA intercepted a hacked radio transmission in Derry on Bloody Sunday. And there he was literally giving orders to the British High Command, a journalist for the Times. And uh, Ricky Tomlinson, the actor who you know from the royal family and loads of movies, and now came out the other day that Richard Whiteley, he was a, an, an MI5 operative, like many, and he was a journalist too. So it's very common. So it's cults and journalism, and 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 the cult also runs journalism too. They'll have a news site to attack people. They'll have a so-called alternative news site or alternative video or TV channel, and that's also part of the the of entrenching the cult members deeper into the matrix of the cult so the intelligence service has people who are completely dependent now you just think about it you go into a cult with your phd and you start believing the cult leader has some special powers and you spend years in there working for them there's no way out you're not what do you do when you go to apply for a job when you leave uh, i was waiting for a comet with a spaceship and a god inside it uh, we were waiting for the uh, the aliens to come on a spaceship and land on the White House lawn. This is, this is why this is why I don't trust the whole UFO connection to government. When people say, "Oh well, UFOs, we have government eyewitnesses in the form of military and police." Oh really? Oh really? Yeah, you you, you really trust that because you would trust the same people because they're military government officials to give you the truth about the government hiding things. Anyway, I digress. The Solar Temple was another one when the uh, the Swiss police and that I means we're talking about something like I think maybe two hundred people have either been murdered or suicided connected to that cult. Uh, it's incredible. It's the body count is off the scale even by cult numbers, and they they're still happening in waves. They think they're still they're still killing themselves. Their their dissociation their dissociative uh, personalities are still switching on, but they're probably still being used. Uh, the south of France uh, seems to be an enormous place for cults. The Raelians are there. The Solar Temple was there. The uh, there's a few others. There, the, 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 there's a whole division where in the French military, uh, geared towards creating cults, and uh, just for that reason, just as for running operations like this, this is a uh, this is probably what happened with the, when the Greenpeace Rainbow Warrior was bombed. And uh, the actual guys who bombed that, they were probably, you know, been programmed in a cult or something like that. Uh, it goes on and on and on. It uh, It's just everywhere from the Mansons to maybe even many of the serial killers. In fact, I think the Son of Sam is probably, a, is probably one too. And there's a lot of evidence that Mark Chapman who took was, was a, well, he was involved in a cult, in a, a hippie cult in, in a ha Hawaii that betrayed him. And that hippie cult, this kind of was, this was the liberty done to make him, you know, he thought he'd found his perfect, like, spiritual family. He thought he'd found everything he wanted. And then they, they stole his money and basically dumped him out of the cult. Well, that was, a, that was a trauma based mind control thing because he'd never trust anyone and wander in the darkness for the rest of his life until he was activated in upstate New York and Yonkers to go down to Manhattan and take care of uh, John Lennon. There's a, I spoke, I was, I spoke to a copper who was on the scene when John Lennon was killed that day. There were several Mark Chapman seen around the area. One was, one had, one was even dressed like him, looked like him, even carrying the same albums. One was, one was tailing, um, it was either Woody Allen or Woody Allen or, uh, what's his name from Paul Simon. Uh, at the, at the moment that, at the moment, that John Lennon was shot in the Dakota building. So this shows a, I mean, this shows an intelligence operation, an enormous one that was going down at the time. And when the cops tried to investigate that case, they were thrown all over the place. There was an FBI agent on the on the scene who still refused to get the ambulance because he wanted. This is what the copper told me. He, unless uh, he saw his green card, they deliberately delayed it so Lennon would die. So this is how dark it is. It all, and they're all cult. This all goes back to the cults. So, you know, you, you see these things and you say to yourself, oh, I'm looking at this website and they all, they're all like, they all believe that there's some kind of aliens coming or there's some kind of shift coming or there's some kind of flush of, you know, coming and reality is changing and they all think they're going to survive it. And at first it seems comical, but then you look under the surface and you see the, the terror campaigns, the smear campaigns, you'll see the the passive aggressiveness used towards uh, 
anyone who has been dealt, you'll see ex-members having their private lives splashed all over the place. I have two feelings toward this. One, I think anyone who's stupid enough to get involved in that after they see all this stuff happening probably deserves to be whatever fate they get. I, I know that sounds cold, but that's what happened. You know, it's like, you know, they see all they see all these horrific smear campaigns against ex-members, and they think that they would be immune to it because it's not happening to them at that moment. This shows an unbelievable dissociation, but it's also part of the the highly educated why why they, they source out highly educated people. The supernatural and black magic occultic aspects of this, well, it comes directly from Freemasonry. If you see my film Occult Dublin, you'll see how that functions. The idea of the battle tactics uh, around the communal and um, hospitality ideas of of the of the lodge being together, feeding together, eating together. Diet is very you see it's very you'll see in the Freemasonic battle rites, diet and uh, uh, methodologies of food eating and stuff is very specific. And the same things with cults. It doesn't matter what the food type is, but the diet is always specific. You must order, you must always eat meat or you must always meet carbohydrates or you must always meet eat a certain amount of, of, of colored food on a particular day. It doesn't matter what the diet is. People say it's low, it's low protein diets to make a brain mushy. That is it could be the case, but other ones it could be high protein. The fact is the diet is regimented. The diet is regimented. So you'll have like uh, you know, they, they have this thing that you can only eat salmon. You know, you'll see the Christmas dinner and they'll be on the table as the salmon, you know, and because they think every other thing, everything else is, 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 is a, the, the cult leader is told that everything else is poisonous. Uh, things like breathing exercises is a huge one. You can actually send a person into a psychedelic state through heavy breathing, through breathing exercises. That's a really big one. But also the dissociation, too, as well. Like you would say things like uh, you must keep your body pure. And yet they're all drug addicts and alcoholics or else they're they're all completely clean and they will they will say things like uh you know you can do whatever you want all drugs are fine you know it's it's this association you're given one message and your brain your subconscious relays it another way what what do I, what's really going on what you know you never you're always confused you never know what's what's going on you know it's very interesting the reason another thing that this is sexuality a lot of cults ex, a lot of Gay, gay guys or secret gay guys or guys with gay feelings in college who may come from traditional Catholic backgrounds or not, often enter into cults which claim that they can cure homosexuality through, uh, through things like uh, hypnotism and things like that, or else exercise or, you know, meditation or chanting. But also, if they're not homosexual, they, they could keep them deliberately sex starved for a long time. And then they will show them a woman in the group that will be there if you do your thing. So, and they've had a pivotal age where their, their hormones are raging. They'd be, they'd be told, they were told that they have to deny their sexuality in order to, you know, be pure and spiritual and this kind of thing. But at the same time, they, they, there'll be women walking around the, the cult compound with their low cut dress and their skirt, you know, a flirty fishing kind of thing. And it's the kind of thing is you'll get that if you do as you're told. And when you are so sexually starved in your 20s, an evangelical notion that you're some kind of knight or something in order to get that power inside inside the uh, inside the cult. You know, it's like the cult leaders, uh, family members or so, your sister or something like that. Then you really feel like you're entering into a royalty or a king and you will be you will be you'll be harvested as the ultimate kill bot, the ultimate kill bot. Uh, when the time comes, they, they, you remember your cult leaders that you adore and worship. They're literally when they disappear for a few days, they're off to meet the CIA, the French Secret Service, MI5, MI6, you name it. That's where Mossad, that's where they're off meeting. And they're getting the latest orders on who to attack, who to undermine, what political politician to attack. See, another way, politi- it's also u- useful for taking down politicians. I'm seeing massive cult uh, things with, with the Trump thing. All, a lot of cults are being organized, particularly the new age against that. We saw that with the stupid uh, pretend witches thing, this kind of thing. It all worked out. Uh, it's, 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 it's an amazing subject when you get into it. But that's the reason why just about every cult or every alien contactee organized group, you know, that living together and stuff like that. Almost without exception. I mean, I can't find one that isn't are directly connected to the military or the intelligence 
the services because that is what they're used for. They're, they're used for nonlinear, highly unethical warfare and military and intelligent espionage tactics that are highly illegal, but the dirty trail doesn't go back to the military or the intelligence services. It goes back to the loony and the cult of the dead eyes. But they said the Space Brothers would come. You hear a lot about exorcism. You hear a lot about the Catholic Church taking an entity from someone, taking an entity from an ent you know, a child or a, a possessed person. You hear this a lot. But it's not only Catholics who perform exorcisms, Protestants do as well. All the Abrahamics do. Now, what no one ever thinks about is that the they the demon is or the entity is brought to the surface, okay? And you know, you have the, the Catholic priest over there spewing the holy water and doing the rites of exorcism. What the Catholic Church never tells you is where the demon goes. It hops into another person. They release the demon out of the being into the person, into another person. This is why many priests, this is why there's so much paedophilia in the Catholic Church, is because, and all these horrible Presbyterians who do exorcisms, is because uh, the, the entity jumps into a priest. You saw that Father Karras at the end of the exorcist, at the end of the exorcist, they were telling you the real truth there. The priest, if he's a selfish, kind man, will absorb the entity into him and then kill himself rather than have the demon, that, that's the only way to get the demon back to the, to, uh, the abyss. Exorcising the demon brings it out. Now, it probably will come as a surprise to you that I have done this, but I haven't brought the demon out of the being person. I brought the demon to the surface. And I'll give you a story that happened about five years ago. Four, five years ago, there was this DJ on a a minor radio station with about six listeners uh, here in Ireland who started shit with me. Incredibly passive aggressive, smoked astounding amounts of cannabis. Perfect. And I was suspicious about there was the passive aggressive, the smugness, the huge amounts of cannabis uh, that this person was taking, that I was suspected that there was an entity inside him, but a, a minor one. And I tolerated him. Until I had, a, I got fed up with him, and he, and I told him, to, I told him to piss off or something like that, and he, he started a smear campaigning me on the internet. You see, this is what the ones who smear campaign, like a normal person, if someone pisses them off, asshole, a few times, or they go away, there is an entity behind the smear campaign, either through things like crystal meth, cannabis use, heavy alcoholism. Or sex freaks, people who are into, you know, uh, uh, human suffering, and they like things like going to S and M clubs and burning women with cigarettes, that kind, those types. They all are infected. Now, and people in the, the circle, it becomes like a kind of a clustering of the same entity, uh, a very powerful one. And you can always tell them by they babble, bleh, they talk shite, they make up lies, they have dead eyes, they're hysterical, they go into massive hysteria. And uh, so how I got the demon out of him was, I coaxed it out. Now, this is, a, this is a dangerous game, so don't play it. But don't play it in person. I was doing it online. And so anyway, I got him to run the smear campaign. And what happens usually is, people who love me, hex them. <clears throat> I don't do it. My army do. And uh, just observed him quietly. Suddenly he starts acting very strangely on the internet. The entity that was in there was not getting its food because he was disrupted. He wasn't work he wasn't functioning properly. He was malfunctioning. And uh, this I'll never forget this as long as I live. He made up a story. He was posting that I've been kidnapped against my will and I've been taken away, please. And all these stupid fucking truthers were going, oh no, he's been kidnapped. We were... I was laughing my head off. This, this was the, the entity desperate for someone to bring weed over to his house or something like that. And then the last thing he ever posted was, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. As lo I've screenshotted it and saved it for posterity. He wrote, laugh out loud, 
I am a spiritual gangster. That's the actual term he used. Laugh out loud. I am a spiritual gangster. The next thing that happened was we heard nothing for about a week and found out that his family had sectioned him in a maximum security psychiatric hospital here in Ireland where he was in a straitjacket in the corner of a room screaming and howling. Uh, you pay when you play. And uh, I took extreme satisfaction in this for a short while. And uh, what happened then was He's come out of hospital, out of mental hospital, and never bothered me ever since. And the entity that was inside him almost certainly jumped into another schizophrenic inside the psychiatric hospital. It was fair game. He started the war, and I finished it with some help. And that's how it always goes. Now, the entity uh, is wild and furious. It, it goes from zero to a hundred. It cannot... It cannot uh, maintain itself in a, in a kind of a sense of pacing. There's the initial, it's, you can always tell them, there are, what, you know, anyone who's been, has ever been on crystal meth, not many heroin addicts. Heroin addicts seem to get over pill heads, uh, extreme alcoholics, uh, continuous cannabis smokers. Now, uh, he's against my shamanic medicine. I'll give you another example. A demon-infected whore of the abyss, a cancerous, malignant uh, entity of pure debt and hate, a uh, recipe for misery. And this thing is an absolute drag. I've already forgiven it once for stabbing me in the back. But now I have told the, the witches of Turin to unleash their worst upon this creature and obliterate it and all it loves from the face of the earth. And... Uh, you cannot have someone who's that heavily infected with an entity in society because all they do is they cause horrific trauma for everyone around them. You do their families a favor by putting them in a psychiatric hospital you, or whatever. They, you, you do their families a favor because it's the only chance of the entity ever getting out was inside a psychiatric hospital where you have lifelong patients who's what you call it, their firewall is down and it can jump. And maybe you can save them, maybe they can be redeemed, but some can, some just don't because there's no demarcation line between the entity and the person. It becomes fused in one. And the internet is a phenomenal place for this. When they go on the internet uh, howling and screaming and having their emotions, uh, unable to control their emotions and bringing as many people as possible into it, uh, they're just all they're doing is supercharging like a battery the entity inside them and uh, it only makes them feel more horrible and worse and sickened and it's a horrible feeling i'd imagine knowing that you've got this like no knowing you'll never be satisfied ever again imagine that feeling that's that's what it's like with these types they're never because the thing inside them is like a spiritual tapeworm it eats and it eats and it feeds and it gorgeous and uh, it never ever stops and it babbles, babbles and babbles and babbles all the time. Uh, you know the thing of speaking in tongues, you know, the babbler in the abyss and all that thing. That's all true. That's all absolutely true. So uh, by coaxing the entity to the surface, you are aware of what you're dealing with. Because it's quite different than dealing with someone who's suffering from basic mental illness. Someone who's suffering from ba basic mental illness doesn't boast about their mental illness. They don't look for sympathy. They don't look for enablers. They don't look for, they, they, it, but the ones who are in fact, you can always tell, now there are ones who do have mental illness, who uh, do ask for help, not the ones who ask for help. A person who is too, too sad inside themselves will not be passive aggressive. It just will not happen. But the entity inside, then you, you can always tell. That's why I have a, two things I have a zero tolerance. One is attempting to gaslight me. Two is passive aggressiveness. Now, I'll accept passive aggressiveness and smugness for a little while, but then if I see it's a, a, an ongoing trade, well, trade, well you, look for what they, you look for the other markers. The entity inside them wants weed. It wants alcohol. Now, this was made very clear to me years ago when I was living in New York at a Santa Maria ritual where a woman in brought forth this entity that was able to help people who'd lost things. I couldn't understand it because it was in Spanish that well. But uh, this woman, little Puerto Rican woman, well, I think she's Puerto Rican, well, Latino, 
She drank a whole bottle of Jack Daniels, I think it was. Uh, it was back, I can't remember, and smoked cigars. And when she came out of the trance, stone cold sober. It was the entity, this is why they call it spirits. It was the entity inside it that wanted the cigars, cocaine, and, and uh, booze to look out for. Inability to control its emotions. You know, hatred that doesn't need to exist. And I don't, I'm not talking about like, I'm not talking, and whoredom. Uh, if it's a woman acting like an old whore, acting like an old slut, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, that's the other side of it. And as soon as you recognize them, that, that this is what's going on, they will psychically harvest you. They will play mind games with you. They'll be passive aggressive. They will try to gaslight you. You're not a Christian, right? Uh, you hear these, oh, i got to save him. I'm a Christian. Oh, i got to save him for the Lord. I'm a Christian. Oh, I want to help them. I want to help them. Nah. How is again? Two videos today. At, uh, I'm in that kind of mood. And um, this one's a kind of an interesting one. You know, I've had plenty of strange paranormal experiences. And... You'd say, okay, that's from an interest in magic and the occult, you probably bring these things forward. And that's absolutely true. But there's another kind of, so we say, invocation or summoning that's done by people who don't actually know they're doing it. And they're paranormal investigators. Now, a lot of paranormal investigators don't actually understand that they're magi magicians accidentally and how this happens is it's very interesting the years ago a, a guy called ted holiday wrote a book with colin wilson called the goblin universe i think it was called and it kind of covered this thing that the it was one of the books that went deeper into the paranormal than than you know had been of that point which is a very kind of specialized field and it's one of the first books to kind of play on the idea that ghosts fairies demons ufos cryptoids lake monsters were actually all the same thing and were manifestations of the the consciousness often of paranormal investigators and there was very interesting things like well john keel has done a lot of good work into this who wrote the mothman prophecy uh, probably a benchmark in paranormal research and fortean research but um you know, he had compiled huge amounts of data on this. And, you know, in terms of the men in black sightings, whenever there was anything to do with, you know, if you had a UFO investigator, see, there'd be two kinds of paranormal, two kinds of paranormal investigators. Ones who absolutely believe, you know, they, they're, they're determined and they, 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 they don't have any objectivity. They, and they have very fixed, fixed notions about, Oh, I'm I'm going UFO watchings because tonight I'm going to see an alien spacecraft from another planet. Or there are types that go ghost hunting. And I'm going to go ghost hunting in this castle tonight to see the ghost of a dead person. Well, what they discovered was that those people don't actually have paranormal experiences. But what's remarkable and what's strange, well, it's not really strange when you think about it is if you had a paranormal investigator who was di diligent and neutral, who said, I'm going to investigate, you know, any Fortean topic. And if they did it diligently with a sense of neutrality and a sense of balanced appraisal, they had the most remarkable paranormal or Fortean events happen to them. And this is when they became accidental magicians. The stories of Loch Ness monster hunters who would go to Loch Ness diligently looking for the monster, doing calculated uh, surveys, every kind of thing, ruling out everything that wasn't it, in just in the hope of trying to establish that there is a monster in the lake, or maybe could be, was any true to it, as you say, not the hope, but there's any true to it. And they would have paranormal experiences like see UFOs. Now, this, you know, you've seen my video on, you know, my, my opinion on the Loch Ness Monster. It was actually an entity that's been trapped in this reality 
by Alistair Crowley's inability to close the Abermelon, the mage ritual when he was living in Boleskine House. I will put the link down below if you haven't seen that video. So, and that was common UFO. If you had a diligent UFO investigator who wasn't desperate to see a spaceman on spaceships and was just interested, they would have the most incredible men in black encounters. Most incredible. Or, or, or things like see the Virgin Mary. It was like oh, just strange things they would see. You know, it was like they almost had a, a paranormal crossover. It, they almost thought they got a licorice all sorts of, uh, of the paranormal uh, coming at them. They may be investigating cryptids and see UFOs. They may be investigating UFOs and see a ghost. It's the strangest thing. But the book, The Goblin Universe, and it's a long time. I should read it again. It's a long time. But it's... But, uh, but it covers that quite well, as John Keel's uh, book, I think it's called Our Haunted Planet, he had, a, he had a book on this stuff. Now, I I think I've had, well, I know I've had these experiences. And what is happening is, when you apply yourself digital, diligently to the study of the paranormal, you actually become, you actually start hacking the matrix. And you start to basically conjure up entities. And this is why you these ghost hunters, you know, have to be very careful. They don't really know about them what they're dealing with. In fact, I did an event in Texas about three years ago, and I spoke to some well-known TV ghost hunters there, and I told them, like, I don't believe you're seeing the dead. I believe, you know, I know for a fact you're seeing some kind of entities like gins or something like that. And they were shocked. They're absolutely shocked. They'd never heard that opinion before, and it just goes. They're just constantly on the whole thing. And they were like good ghost hunters, but they weren't like, but they were obsessed with the whole thing that it was a dead people they were looking for. And uh, so this, I think this happened to me. In fact, I know it did. And I may have, in, I may have conjured an entity in central Dublin when I was young that's been following me all, my, all through my life. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's. Oh, let me tell you how I got into this stuff. When I, you know, when I was about eight, there was a newspaper. It's, it might, it might still exist. There was a trash newspaper in Dublin called the Sunday World. And I think one weekend for about a month, they did a feature every Sunday on UFO aliens and UFOs. And I was eight or nine, and I was utterly captivated by these articles, completely captivated. And. I, you know, and I used to cut the articles out and collect them in a scrapbook. It was the first time I heard of Betty and Barney Hill and all these funny abduction stories and stuff like that from around the world that were known at that time. Roswell was even mentioned in it. You know, it was like the usual thing. Do the Americans have alien technology? This kind of thing. And uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. It, it was a wonderful sense of sort of like you know, mystery and the world. It's one of those things when you're a little kid. I mean, it's, you know, this is why I feel sorry for atheists because they don't have this feeling where they, we, a lot of us get, a lot of us would kind of watch this kind of channel, would get when we were young, when we first read about UFOs or, you know, something like that. This sense of wonder. It's, it's, it's the, that, the, that the world is bigger than, than this, you know. It's a beautiful feeling, actually. It's, it's so exciting when you're into it, when you're young. And then... Okay, well, you know, when I got older, I was about 17, 18, and I started going to technical college. And the course that I was doing required that I worked during the week with a company for one year. Now, this was the early 80s, and so I, it was a pretty rough schedule when I think about it. I used to work in a company that did, that did audio rental equipment where I was to learn about sound engineering and repairing amplifiers and stuff. And then three nights a week on top of that, four, I think three or three nights a week on top of that, I went to technical college in Kevin Street in Dublin. It's now, it's, 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 it's either closed down or closing down now, but it was the main technical college in the city centre and uh, on Kevin Street. And a very, very ancient part of Dublin, right next to St. Patrick Cathedral, right in the heart of the Liberties, the most ancient part of the city. And this was the early 80s, and Dublin was a very different city then than it is now. And there was a man, I, I, there's a man that used to, I lived in Talla at the time, and there was a man that lived in Talla, a neighbour, who found out that I was going to the college. And he worked for some company in the Liberties, around Francis or Mead Street area. 
And he used to pick me up two of those nights and take me home. And I was glad for it because I didn't have to wait in the cold for a bus. And, uh, you know, I got a car home much quicker and everything. And she, I didn't have to spend bus fare. And a uh, very nice man. But I had to meet him in a place called Pimlico, which is in the heart of the old city. Now, when I say Dublin was very different in the early 80s, it might as well have been 1880 compared to today. I mean, it was still coal fires in these old, these ancient dwellings that were, there were still Dutch style, what they call Dutch billies all around the area, or ruins of them, when the city was a Dutch style city after the William, the, uh, William of Orange. After the Battle of the Boyne, they started building the city in Dutch architecture. And there's still quite a few of those Dutch, what they're called Dutch billies type buildings still left in old Dublin. But it was it was ancient. And this place I had to meet him up as a corner in Pimlico, which is like, there'll be nobody around at night. There's no pubs in, on the street. In the, well, it was like a side street in Pimlico. And it was just, it, you might as well have been in 1800s, you know. And so the nights I didn't take the bus, he would meet me there. Now, at the same time, as well as I do my studies, I was interested in magic. I was, you've read my book, Sorcery. I talk about how the magic practice infected my, affected my interest in electronics. And uh, it was a huge learning thing for me that I realized what the nervous system really is about. In the sort of rudimentary way I could think of it. Th- same time, I was still a paranormal, still fascinated with the paranormal. Although I kind of realized by then that aliens had nothing to do with mechanical spaceships from other planets. And, but I was, there used to be a newspaper in Dublin called the Evening Press. And during the winter months every night, I think it was, there was an, an article on haunted Dublin. And it used to have articles about a poltergeist in here or a ghost sighting there or a, a mysterious entity they call the Dotchler who lived was it that would attack people in this area, or ghosts of Vikings seen in this part of the city, that kind of thing. And it was fantastic stuff. It was just fantastic. I used to love reading it, and I kept kept, kept the articles and collected them. Now that's not unusual for people interested in magic and occult to go also into the paranormal. That's what you know. Jack Parsons was big into that as well, a lifelong enthusiast of it actually. And anyway. One of the nights I, I, I arranged to meet him, it was about nine o'clock at night after the course finished. And I'd walk to the street corner and up until that point I'd be saying, there's a lot of stories about haunted Dublin that appeared in the, in the press, in the evening press, took place in these old, old areas. And it was, you might, you might be back in James Joyce times. It was that, it was that you know, ancient still in the early 1980s. And I'd be standing at the corner awaiting and then one evening, this thing is the only way I could describe it. It was a human, I guess, in the middle of the depths of winter where I had an anorak with the hood up on me, a scarf here, a zipped up like this, you know, like those old tones, <laughs> the face was like that. And I was like, to keep the cold out and the breath coming out of it like a, like a steam pipe. And it comes, it comes up to me wearing a denim jacket and a t-shirt like you'd wear in summer you know the old wrangler jackets remember them uh opened with a t-shirt on me and he had a face and he was small and he had a face like i didn't know whether he was 15 or 55 i can't explain that i can't but his head was squashed and it was like he was about that height on me i was you know teen t- I wasn't much taller and short, probably the same height now as was then. About there, I mean, his head stopped there. And he comes up to me like this and he goes, Who are you? I know you. Who are you? I know you. I know you. Who are you? How old are you? I know you. Who are you? I know you. I know you. Over and over again. And I didn't answer him and I absolutely got freaked out. And I ran to the bus stop to get away from him. And, he was, and I could hear him coming down the, the road behind me going, who are you? I know you. Who are you? What's the... And he said, he said, what are you doing? Who are you? I know you. I know you. Like that. And what I remember most about him was the smell of his breath. It was like the sewer opening. Okay? And uh, the demanding way he came right up my face. Right? And uh, I just thought it was a local freak. Okay? A local, a local oddball. Okay? And then 
I never dealt with that. I didn't have to do that again because I wouldn't take the lift off the guy anymore because I just was worried he might have been with a gang or something. Yeah, get beat up and I didn't want to be around there at night. And so it was, and it was near the end of the course anyway, before the summer recess. And I dropped out after the first year anyway. And uh, so it was, it was awful. Okay. It was awful, stressful and awful feeling of, you know, sort of like discombobulated inside myself. So, uh, years, many years, many, many years passed, and I come back from America, and uh, I get a job in Dublin, and I'm living on the South Circular Road, again, old, old, old part of the inner city, I had a flat there, and I'm walking down the South Circular Road, coming home from work one night, in my suit and tie, and uh, this fairly attractive blonde woman, but this one was tall, stands, starts walking next to me, and immediately I hear the same voice saying, I know you, who are you, who are you, I know you, how old are you, I know, I know you, I know you, like that. And I nearly had to put my hand up my arse to hold the shite in. I was so terrified. It just, it did, did the same and the same, I was terrified of this person. This was not human, this thing. This, and, and it was like, it had this, it had gone back 20 Odd years in time, 22 years in time to Pimlico and, and I had the same experience with this thing. And then, you know, that was the only one time and I ran away from it again. Would have followed me down the street going, I know you, hey, I know you, you know, who are you? I know you, with the same voice, the same voice, okay? And uh, so after a few months, I started thinking about it a lot and I said, oh, it's probably a kind of a man and men and I'd read the, the Goblin Universe by that by that point, and also John Keel's books, and I'm thinking, I wonder was it kind of a man in, a man in black type thing, you know, because they do appear as women and stuff like that, and it was it was less frightening to me because I was starting to understand what I was dealing with, you know, potentially, and it happened again about five years ago, and again in central Dublin, I was on Liffey Street, and there was a shop there that sold Brazilian imports artwork and paintings and carved things from the from the as as amazon and uh, i was looking at these they were basically tourist trinkets or you know these kind of ex export shops a little small shop on liffey street near the halfpenny bridge and i'm looking in the window and i hear behind me and again it was three times it was at night because the shop was closed but the lights were on i hear who are you what's that i know you who are you what's that where are you going how old are you the same questions again and I didn't look at the thing this time. And I turned around and I faced towards the Haypenny Bridge. And I walked over the river into Temple Bar. With it still behind me on Liffey Street going, I know you, who are you, how old are you, I know you, what's that? This the same questions. And I've, I haven't heard it ever since. And I'm absolutely convinced that it was one of these kinds of men in black type things. Probably brought out of the field by my intense interest as a, as a teenager in paranormal stuff. And so it wasn't something I conjured or something I had brought forward or channeled or invoked or anything like that or summoned. It was created probably, you know, it's so strange, it, an entity in the, in the old city that probably went back thousands and thousands of years that had somehow manifested itself in me around me for the simple purpose of extracting my energy now this is this is where we get into the fairy things there was a great belief in rural ireland that you didn't you did you did everything to make sure the fairies never came and so one of the things was to not even talk or think about fairies See, because when you think about it if you were talking about there's fairies in this area or whatever, you're really the, the pre-20th century version of a paranormal investigator. You know what I'm saying? And these the old people realized this and figured this out. And that's what they would be saying. They would say, don't, 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 you know, don't talk about the devil. Don't talk about the demons. Don't talk about the, the fairies. You know, even if you're interested in them, they'll, they'll, they'll come and get you or something like that. Don't talk about them. This kind of thing. And this was also extended into places that Catholic countries that talking about 
apparitions of the Blessed Virgin would bring the Blessed Virgin. People who say, don't talk about it, you might bring the Blessed Virgin forward, even though that might have been considered by some to be a beautiful blessing. But to, to most people, it wasn't. It was quite frightening. Quite frightening. And so it was like that. You don't talk about it. And so, or you don't think about it deeply. So I, I was probably so deeply fascinated. I used to go around Dublin prior to the first manifestation of this old city, looking for these locations where this paranormal stuff happened. And I'd be like, why did that happen there? You know, but, uh, UFOs in the Phoenix Park, that's a fascinating, you know, that's kind of thing. And I used to, you know, but, uh, there was so much emotional uh, thrill and excitement in it that that was probably what created the charge to lock this thing on me so it could extract my life energy through fear. And that's what you a lot of you read John Keel's work on the men in black. A lot of it is extraction of life energy. Like during the Vietnam War, they were, it, they, they get, someone in America would get a knock on the door and say, your son Bobby was killed in Vietnam. And the woman would scream. And they get, this men in black guy character would walk away. And then the woman would find out a few days later, after, or a day later after calling the army, no, your husband's still alive. You can talk to him on the phone. We've got a message from him. And uh, you think, why would it do such a thing like that to harvest the energy? Because the, the, you'd have women all over America, and I'm sure it happened in other countries during wars as well, where there was a fear of the husband or the brother or the son dying. And so this entity would manifest in the area for the, the, for the extraction of energy. And that energy is psychic life force from them. And this is what that's really about. And that's, I, I'm convinced, and these things exist on the internet. They, they exist on the internet too. And they're very easy to spot after a while. But they, 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 you know, they're the type of thing that creates multiple accounts. And uh, constantly bothers you on a, on, a, on a thing or something like that. They are all, and you can't, they're mysterious. There's no, and people say, oh, they're just trolls. No, they're more than that. No normal, no person of a psychiatric nature, a balanced psychiatric nature puts all that effort into creating all these multiple accounts on the same day, uh, at the same time. And so you you you, you see you, they, they appear. And I always say this thing that Deepak Chopra has created a digital version of himself to live forever on the internet. Now what a tragedy that is, because Deepak Chopra, when he first started that was brilliant. His books on etymology and sacred sounds and his work into the, the, the Hindu Vedas was some of the first books in the field I ever read that were so accessible and opened it up to me. And now he's the digital and now he's now he's mating He's being sodomized in the elect in the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum by the digital jinn. That's what that's the fate he's chosen for himself. And so you re at that you read that, but but that's probably because some entity has taken him over through the internet or through his meditation. This is why I don't trust meditation because if you're these, he's always talking about how many hours a day he meditates. Yeah, well that's an hour. That's several hours a day. Your your psychic firewall is down, and entities can get into you. All you have to do is look at someone like Russell Brand. And what his transcendental meditation has done to him with his two dead eyes, you know, and he's totally his cliches that say nothing except to harvest energy off the the idiots who listen to his radio, his radio show or his YouTube videos. It's it's amazing. It's amazing how you can be the accidental magician if you're a paranormal investigator, and if you're a paranormal investigator watching this, you have to be careful. You know, running around an old prison screaming. Oh, it's the ghost of Billy McBride who was executed in 1847 for killing a sheriff. You know, this kind of thing. When you're, you're actually conjuring some, some entity that can actually get into you. And, uh, but that's, that's, that's one of the most... I've had lots of paranormal experiences. And some of them are frightening. But that one was the most frightening one that came to resolution. Was that, that, that one going... I know you. Who are you? What are you? Who are you? What's your name? How old are you? What are you doing here? What's that? Who are you? Who are you? What are you? What are you? Who's your name? Who are you? What are you? 